Um, hi, folks. Uh, let's get started. So today, my teammate Bogdan and I, Vivek, are going to talk about masking HCV observability. So let's just get into it first. Um, there's a prerequisite that uh, I, we would recommend that you kind of go through. Um, it's just something that we uh, would recommend that you download because some are Docker composed images and internet isn't really stable right now. So if it's possible, then uh, just scan the barcode or just follow the link along and then uh, we get started. I'll just give it a minute. Once we're done, we can just move forward. Okay, I think Bogdan's gonna help you out. Uh, so. Just uh, raise your hand if you have a problem or anything like that. Uh, but we strongly recommend you follow us, uh, follow us along while we go on this journey. It'd be fun. Okay, um, so just moving on, uh, just to kind of review what we're gonna achieve today or what we're gonna learn today, um, just the fundamentals of HCD, um, just talk about leader election in general and how it impacts HCD, uh, the architecture of how, um, how everything is placed, how everything interacts, um, uh, the meat of everything, metrics, and the fundamentals of how they're structured, how you can access metrics, how you can look at them and make sense of it. And then we have a lab session after this, uh, just, just after this brief intro, uh, we just run through a few scenarios of what problems you might run into and what metrics are really important for you to look at in these scenarios. So let's just take a walk. Um, so the basic fundamental question you'd ask is what is HCD? HCD is just a simple key value store. It's distributed in nature. What does that mean? It means that the computation, like the storage layer is separated or like split up on, among different computers and not just one single computer. Um, so all the computation, the storage happens on uh, in a distributed fashion. The next thing is replication. Um, a replica by replication, it means that it replicates data on all the members of the node uh, or, or the cluster. Um, HCD is a cluster and it has multiple members within it. So that's kind of the idea. Um, consistency. So getting and setting or like getting and putting data in it happens in a consistent fashion which is what is primary or like uh, very essential to a database so that's kind of what this uh, makes available and then highly available uh, that just means that until and unless hcd has quorum you're good to go so say for example if hcd has like five members in the cluster and one of them was to go down you'd still get the data and you'd still be able to store data and all that would be fine so just losing a node does not mean that is gonna go down. So that it provides resiliency, and that's what we mean by highly available. So let's just kind of understand uh, leader election. Uh, leader election is done by Raft um, in this case. Uh, Raft is just the fundamental algorithm that HCD uses to perform leader election. And why leader election is important is because it helps you uh, keep the data consistent. Um, so let's just look at this. Um, just keep in mind there are two concepts, um, a leader and a follower. A leader is just the one that uh, runs or like makes sure that everyone, everyone is in sync. And leader or the followers are just the, the other members of the cluster. So there's that. Now let's just look at leader election. Um, so if you see like um, there are five members in the cluster and there's a gray timeout or like a gray bar that's going over. That's just the election timeout. So after this timeout, uh, um, all the members will send a message to everyone. And this is a candidate message, which means they, hey, uh, I'm a candidate to become a leader and it sends it to everyone. And then once everyone confirms like, hey, I think I got your message and I'm good to go, uh, they will accept the candidacy and move to uh, agreeing that, yeah, this uh, one person should be the leader. In this case, S1 becomes a leader. And the second timeout is about the heartbeat. So once the election is over, uh, the leader periodically will keep sending messages to the followers to just check like if the health of all the followers is fine and if they're healthy and within the cluster itself. So this just helps us kind of understand how HCD operates uh, within its members. Uh, the next item is architecture. So um, just in general, how HCD is structured and what are the main components that we should be looking at uh, when you're thinking about HCD. 
So one is the server side, uh, which is just generally the API that you'd access. Uh, Raft is the algorithm that etcd runs on top of, as we saw in the previous slide uh, regarding the leader election. Um, the next one is MBCC. Uh, it's just a multi-version concurrency control. D don't worry about these uh, terms. Like we already have a glossary in the GitHub repo as well, just in case if you have to review it back. But just to get, give you a brief idea, MBCC is just for you, uh, to put it simply, it just tracks all the revisions of your keys. So you had a key and you updated the key 50 times. Uh, the MBCC stores all the revisions of the keys. So it basically stores all the updates that you made to the key so far. Uh, the next thing is a client. A client is just a simple computer that you, you'd, act, you'd use to kind of access the HED server and uh, BoltDB. Now, BoltDB is the backend that uh, we use to store data in HCD as well. It's a very simple database, and that's kind of its feature. Like, simplicity is what BoltDB brings to the table. Um, there's the write-ahead write log, which is just, uh, it's just a log of all the transactions you've committed so far, and it just stores all of that um, on, uh, in, the, in the server. Now, th this is how all the items interact with each other. So if you see, like, uh, just if you start your journey from the client, you hit the gRPC server, and then you think of this HCD server as the central brain to like the whole architecture of HCD. It connects to different components, and this is kind of how we think about HCD when you generally just go through different items. Uh, so now let's just jump into a few operations. So that was a reference diagram that we saw before, and now we're going to see how HCD performs like all these operations that we mentioned. So we're just going to jump into read and write, but um, just to give you a brief background on what a transaction is, it's just a complicated combination of uh, reads and writes, and that's what um, you just want to do two things in one go, or maybe you'd want to do multiple writes in one go. So that's what you use the transaction for, and a watch. Uh, what is, um, if you think about it, like if you have a key in mind uh, that you want to check updates on frequently. So if a key gets updated, you get an event back saying, hey, the key got updated to this value and so on and so forth. So until you're watching the key, uh, it keeps sending you updates as and when the key gets updated. Um, so this is a read flow diagram. Uh, if you see, um, um, let me just zoom in a little bit. Might be easier, yeah. Okay. So if you see um, the, just let's just uh, walk through a request, right? Um, you send a request, it hits the gRPC server first, which then gets forwarded to the HCD server loop. From there on, what happens is in the third step, you get a read index. Now, what does that mean? A read index in general means that it'll, find, it'll talk to the leader and get the latest um, read revision, which means this is the uh, latest version that the database was updated to uh, when the request came in. And this is kind of important for consistency as we spoke about before. Uh, once it gets the read index from the leader, sometimes it, this uh, member might be the leader itself. So it just finds out what the read index is and then finds the late, latest KV pair, which is just a key value pair and responds with whatever the data was. So that's kind of a simple read transaction, uh, a read operation. Uh, it's simplified, there's a lot going on obviously, but uh, this is a very simplistic approach just for the sake of this presentation. Okay. Um, so let's look at a write flow. This is a little more complicated than read. Um, let's look at all the components that it walks through in general. So you sim similarly, you put, it, put in a request, it goes through the gRPC server, um, it hits the HCD server loop, and then what happens is um, there are two, three steps if you see. There's a replicate which goes through the peers, and there's uh, another persist one uh, which persists to the transaction to the wall log. Um, so what happens is once the server gets the request, it goes through Raft. Raft makes sure that the quorum is kind of met in the sense that it'll agree with at least the majority of the members of the cluster and say like, yeah, this looks good. I think we're good to go. So in that case, once Raft agrees that uh, this transaction is committed and most of the members actually got it, it persists to itself and also sends it to all the members so that the data is replicated. So in the instance of one member going down, you still won't lose the data in that point, but it also means it's consistency. And then once that's done, it just applies it simply to the MVCC store and sends you a response back. And just keep in mind, uh, it also syncs it to the Bolt DB asynchronously every 100 milliseconds or so, so that it doesn't like kind of queue up the disk as much, right? It's just cheaper this way to uh, batch transactions and not do them all at once. So this was just a simple write flow. And now, uh, so let's get into the meat of what our presentation is about. 
Um, so just we kind of, to recap, we just saw a primer on what a theory is, what kind of transaction it performs, and the leader election that we saw. Uh, after that, now we're in metrics. So just uh, uh, HED produces or like generates a Prometheus-based metrics. Uh, it just means that if you just um, have, it just spins up a Prometheus server and then scrape, like presents all the metrics which you can then scrape. Um, you can scrape it from the metrics endpoint. The, if you just hop onto a host and just do a slash metrics, you should be able to see all the metrics that that member is kind of emitting at that point in time. Now the detail level. So you can set the detail level to be basic or extensive. Basic just means that you'd get a smaller set of metrics and then extensive is just, uh, it gives you all the metrics that exist. I think if I remember correctly, there's about 126 metrics that it emits at any point in time. Um, the next one is avoid etcd underscore debugging. Uh, so etcd underscore debugging are metrics that are unstable or in flux right now. They're being developed, so might not be the best kind of uh, presentation at that point. So might want to just avoid it for now. And namespace just means that etcd metrics are namespaced by the module they're kind of working in. So if you have MVCC, then you'd see etcd underscore MVCC underscore whatever the metric name be, and so on and so forth for the server and just any other module that you can think of within etcd. Now, we're gonna focus on these three uh, components for like the most part of our presentation, uh, just to kind of uh, limit the amount of exposure that we make with etcd. But the idea is these three components um, are just kind of be, going to be a focus area with, with respect to operations. Um, now, if you just scan this QR code, um, it's the same QR code that we had like at the beginning, but in case just someone came in late and just wanted to scan it, just want to make sure everything is like fine. So Bogdan's going to take you through just the lab uh, going forward. And uh, just in case if you have any questions, raise your hand. I'll be walking around just in case if you need any help. Uh, just hip, holler at me. Okay, thank you, Vivek. Hello, folks. So we're going to jump into the lab portion of our presentation. Okay. So I hope everyone had a chance to check out the repository um, and run the prerequisites. So I'm going to do it uh, together with you right now. I already have images downloaded, so it will be faster for me. So the first order of business, we're going to bring up uh, uh, our etcd cluster. So what we're doing here, we bring up a three node etcd cluster and Grafana and Prometheus service. And uh, we're gonna use Prometheus to pump metrics from etcd and Grafana for our dashboards. Ignore if, uh, I know there's, there was a question about the logs and some of the errors here. Ignore that there's some Grafana uh, errors, um, that's okay. Now, to verify that everything is working really well, we'll try the benchmark. I'll talk about the benchmark in a bit. Okay, so what I did right now, I ran the etcd benchmark that comes um, uh, as part of etcd repository. For the purposes of this demo, I build a new etcd image to include the benchmark and a couple other tools because the release image obviously doesn't have the benchmark tool. Uh, so what we are doing here, zoom in a little bit. Um, we're doing a we're doing a put benchmark right here. We say the command that we want to execute. Uh, we provide the endpoints that our clients will connect to, and then some information about the type of puts we want to uh, issue and the total number of puts. Um, so the nice uh, thing about the benchmark, it will also provide the summary, but uh, we will be looking at the dashboards mostly for, for our lab. Okay, and the next step, let's check out uh, default etcd dashboard. So um, if some, some people might have a, a Grafana uh, login prompt, so use these credentials if you get that. 
Um, okay, let me do a quick review of this uh, default dashboard. So this is the dashboard that is linked in the documentation, and you can download this from the Grafana uh, website. I'm um, not going to dive in uh, into uh, various areas here, just a quick glance, and then we're going to go into scenarios and uh, uh, hopefully you'll, you'll get more exposure to various metrics through that. Uh, so, uh, SCD uses Ruft. Uh, Ruft is the consensus protocol. It has a notion of the leader, which is uh, very important. So, of course, there's like a big message that we have a leader, because if we don't, then things are really bad. Um, next, uh, RPC rate, um, SCD is the gRPC server, uh, so this is one of the first metrics we want to look at. So we'll have a summary of all rates for all the requests. So we did some puts, so that's why we got some uh, uh, increase here. And after our the benchmark stopped, uh, nothing is happening right now. Then we have active streams, so we have watches and leases. Uh, we won't have time to go into watches and leases, unfortunately, for uh, during this demo. Then we have uh, some information about the uh, database. Uh, so this is the BBOL database, DB size. Notice there's no data here. So it's, there's actually a bug with this dashboard. I didn't fix it, just wanted to show you guys uh, what's going on here. So uh, the problem here is that uh, this metric is a little bit older. It's using this debugging. Uh, metric namespace and was uh, already graduated to non-debugging one. So, uh, so if I do that, that, that actually works. Uh, okay, then we have disk of sync duration. We're going to talk about this uh, later. This is, this is important, uh, especially the wall of sync and then the memory. Then our client traffic in and out. So this is from our benchmark tool. Then peer traffic in and out. This is between the etcd members. Uh, then we have information about the proposals. And we'll also dive into this uh, um, in the next scenario. But important uh, uh, point is that Raft uh, has a notion of proposal. And it's a crucial uh, component of it. So every time you're trying to replicate a log message through Raft, you submit a proposal uh, for that. So that's why keeping track of this is important. And then we have proposals committed, we have proposals pending, and on this one you also have proposals applied. And I'll explain what is the difference between the applied and committed proposals when we get to the next scenario. And we have some disk operations and uh, network. Okay. so. Let's jump into our first scenario. So I called it scenario zero just because this is just ex uh, exposes us to uh, some basic operations, put and ranges for etcd. We're not going to stress out the system uh, significantly in this uh, scenario. Okay, so first thing, let's look at uh, the sequence diagram for puts. So I know Vivek had a uh, diagram for SCD architecture and the uh, right. So I have a little bit more complicated diagram, and I know it has internal SCD details. Oops. But unfortunately, to understand uh, how metric metrics works and what they mean, you have to dive in into some of the SCD internals. Um, okay, is this? Hope this is visible. Let's zoom in a little bit more. Okay, so um, let's walk through put uh, sequence diagram. So etcd is the gRPC server, so the first order of business is to accept those gRPC requests, and there's some boilerplate here, and then put goes into etcd server. So etcd server is a kind of a workhorse. Uh, it does a lot of uh, coordination and uh, uh, translation between the uh, gRPC and in, in various internal layers of the system. So right away, we increment this starter total metric, which is part of the gRPC middleware. So it comes uh, um, as part of the Go gRPC implementation. Uh, next, um, since Ruff doesn't have a notion of put, uh, it, we can't just do a put uh, to, to sort of Ruff protocol. We have to operate 
in proposals. So that's what the SED server is doing. It translates the put uh, into proposal for uh, and, and submits it to Ruff to, uh, to run their log replication. Right away, when we submit the proposal, we increment the proposal's pending. Now, the, the Raft portion of uh, etcd, uh, Raft is implemented, uh, Raft is a standalone library at this point. So recently, I think like maybe half a year, a year ago, etcd uh, refactored Raft into a separate repository. Uh, but uh, this etcd server Raft node is the implementation that is required uh, uh, to run uh, Raft inside the etcd. So when we submit the proposal, so Raft does its magic, goes, communicates to, uh, with the peers, and then you get this, uh, I think, uh, this, this channel, the ready channel, and uh, uh, it's, it's required for Raft implementation to persist the information to the, um, to the storage. So that's the number six is doing here. It's saving uh, this information to wall log. So wall stands for right ahead log. So th this is a very important and crucial piece of, of the equation because uh, every time uh, there is a proposal, uh, each member will save it to uh, wall log. When we save, we actually f sync every time. Right after every time we save, we f sync. Uh, this is, I think, is a little bit different than most databases. I think usually databases don't have sync on every write. But uh, uh, to, uh, to, for raft correctness, you have to have sync and persist the, uh, the data and guarantee the persistence. So that's why uh, we have sync and we increment this wall of sync duration. This is, this is one of the uh, important metrics, in my opinion, uh, because if this is slow, or you know, spiking, you can have uh, uh, obvious performance uh, issues with that CD. So okay, we're done with uh, saving our uh, data to the wall log. So done, we mar mark the proposal as oops, sorry as committed. Um, so proposal commit means it's saved to the wall log, uh, and then uh, flow goes back to our. Etcd server, as I, again, through this like async channel. There's a little bit more going in on etcd server. I'm simplifying here. And then etcd server calls out uh, this apply operation. And uh, this is a second part of our, uh, of our persistent, of, of, of our put. So we save to wall, and then now we need to save it to the backend, to the bball db, and to our mvcc. Uh, so this is what it's doing. So it goes through the applier. It dispatches this uh, to uh, MVCC, so multi-version concurrency control uh, subcomponent of etcd. And what this does, it will create, it will maintain the history of of uh, of your changes. So because Raft itself doesn't um, doesn't have a notion of you know history, it's just a log. So MVCC will create a revision for each uh, uh, change for your key. It will maintain this in-memory index between revisions uh, and, and keys. Um, so that's when we put to this in-memory index, and there's you know some logic here to get the revision, and then we persist to the backend. This is this unsafe sequence put, and this is the backend uh, uh, abstraction. Uh, and the backend for SCD is the bbolt. Uh, Database. This is embedded uh, memory map database. It's a clone of Lightning DB. Notice that um, after we put to the backend, we actually don't uh, commit. Uh, the control flow goes back to the um, etcd server, and then we return. So we mark the proposal as applied, and uh, we decrement proposal pending, and we return to the client. Uh, part of this uh, response will be revision. Uh, that got assigned to like during this MVCC uh, portion, and uh, it can be useful in various uh, scenarios for your uh, for your work. And then uh, backend commits uh, asynchronously, so there's the it will commit every hundred milliseconds or so. Or there's also a buffer, so if the buffer reaches a certain uh, number of operations, I believe it's like a thousand or so, it will commit. And then we increment this backend commit duration seconds metric. So again, important. 
but not as important, in my opinion, as the uh, the wall f sync. Okay, so that was the sequence diagram, and now let's kind of put it in practice and we'll run the little benchmark here for puts. Okay. So I increased the number of puts, so uh, compared to uh, the total flag, uh, just to keep the benchmark running, so it won't exit right away. And we've prepared this dashboard for you, specifically focused on puts. I'm going to collapse the sections just to demonstrate what we got here. So similar to the sequence uh, diagram, I try to group this by uh, etcd components. So there's a gRPC server, there's etcd server, wall log, mvcc, and dbol db. Uh, I mean, of course, for your production dashboards, you probably want to, uh, you know, arrange it in, in a different way. Um, it's hard to really recommend uh, the best arrangement because people have various SLOs, they, uh, various hardware and so on. So uh, I think it's, and also it's a good idea to arrange your own dashboards so you actually understand the, what, uh, what, you know, what sins mean and not just uh, take the default etcd dashboard. So, okay, let's dive in. So we have our gRPC. So we're doing some puts right now. So the start puts incremented. So this is the rate. And we're actually doing uh, quite a lot of load. This is running on the Docker container. So uh, um, the f-sync, I think, is actually pretty good, but uh, because it's right into a VM of some sorts. Um, then we have handle puts. So that's the puts that are already completed. Notice that um, we also display error codes here. So everything's okay right now. You know, we have also 90th percentile latency for puts. So we're like uh, 60 milliseconds. And that's pretty good for amount of uh, load we're doing, in my opinion. Um, now let's jump into NCD server. So this is now about proposals. So as I mentioned, the proposal is the important concept in Ruft. Uh, so we have proposals pending. So this, so these are the ones that you know that went to Raft, uh, but haven't been committed and applied yet. Um, although they, they can be committed, but not applied, it still will count as pending. Um, so we're kind of going towards like 300 here, queuing up some proposals, but overall we uh, we're doing well. Uh, then we have uh, committed rates. So this is the ones that are written to wall. So when, when the proposal, when the raft replicates it and then calls back to our CD member to persist it, uh, the proposal will be written to wall, right ahead log, and will be marked as committed. And then we have proposals applied, uh, and applied means applied to our uh, backend, bbolldb. Okay, so then uh, this is uh, uh, important. Sometimes it's important to see the difference between committed and applied. Uh, if this uh, difference reaches a certain threshold, etcd will stop accepting uh, new proposals, uh, which will be uh, pretty bad for, uh, for everything. Um, and we'll have one scenario which is kind of optional to try to trigger this. Okay, then proposals failed. So everything is good right now. We're not like uh, uh, doing anything crazy with our SD, so uh, nothing is failing. Then slow applies. So this will get incremented. I believe there's 100 milliseconds or 300 milliseconds uh, um, when, if, if the applying portion of the proposal takes more than that, uh, this metric will be implement, uh, incremented and there will be stuff logged into the logs about the slow apply. And then wall, so okay, this is, this is important uh, uh, stuff. So this is the, uh, how much we write per second. And here's like the crucial metric, the wall of sync duration. So we are doing 15 milliseconds. Uh, this is okay. Uh, I've seen much better, I've seen like, you know, worse. I mean, but for, for the traffic we're doing for our demo, I, I think this is, uh, uh, this is good. But uh, uh, SED has, in the documentation, SED has a special uh, a section about performance. 
and uh, there's a, a link to the article how to benchmark your disk and uh, uh, what parameters to use for um, FIO tool, I believe. Uh, so that's pretty useful. You, you, if you, you know, if you're serious about that, uh, you know, I recommend running the benchmark and benchmark your disk. Um, now this is just a sync count. Okay, so we're done with the wall. And uh, for MVCC, we only have one metric here, which is uh, puts uh, per second. Though this one's Th these are the puts that go in through MVCC. And for the uh, B bolt, we got uh, commits per second and uh, uh, database size. Notice that commits per second is, uh, you know, we're doing, doing like 10, uh, much lower than, you know, uh, the wall uh, FCN count. Uh, that's because we commit in, in, in batches. And we have the database size. So notice that the database size is growing right now. We have a scenario uh, when we actually hit the limit, uh, which is by default this uh, two gigabytes. And uh, we'll, we'll talk about what happens then and how to um, avoid that. There are two metrics that are important here with the database size. There is like database uh, uh, total size and uh, database in use. So when we go to compaction section, that's when the uh, database in use, I'll explain how that works. Uh, and we have the uh, commit, uh, backend commit um, 90th percentile. Uh, so we're doing uh, similar to F-Sync. Um, okay, so that's our put. Now let's look at the ranges. So this sequence diagram will be uh, shorter. So again, with the range, uh, etcd is a gRPC server. So uh, for sort of business is to accept that uh, gRPC request and then forward it to the etcd server. So in case of puts, we were doing proposals to the raft. But for range, uh, you know, we're not really uh, submitting anything to the log. We're not proposing. But etcd guarantees the uh, linearizability of, of operations, uh, including ranges, by default. So for that, uh, SED server has to communicate with Raft and get uh, so-called read index to make sure that uh, um, it's in sync uh, with, with other members. So there's, there's a, a, I'll say a quite a, a, some complex logic here to get this read index. You will try multiple times if, you know, if, if, it, uh, if it can't. And if, the, if this is slow, uh, the slow read index metric will be incremented. So uh, important uh, uh, for uh, our range performance. Um, so again, we get, actually when we issue the read index, we we'll still get the notification on, the, on this ready channel, similar to, similar to the puts, uh, but instead of saving to wall, uh, we just uh, write to another channel uh, to notify the SED server. So when this uh, dance is done, then we can uh, go and get our uh, information from the backend. So this doesn't involve any other members now, so this is just local to the node. So we go to the so-called uh, uh, TXN uh, package and call range. So again, we hit our MVCC um, component that is responsible for keeping track of the revisions. So one interesting bit is that uh, uh, the MVCC will query the index for uh, revisions that, that correspond to the keys in the, in the range. And then for each of those revisions, we're gonna issue uh, uh, so this unsaved range to the backend. Uh, sometimes it's kind of confusing because you'd say, oh, range, maybe there's a support for range on the B bolt. So you'll be like, okay, why can I just like, grab uh, everything in optimal fashion, but because of the revisions, uh, it's basically just the range translates into a get for each individual revision. Uh, then we increment this range total, and then we return back to the client. And this is uh, similar here, the GRPC metrics, so we have handle total and handling seconds. 
So uh, actually, when preparing this uh, uh, demo, I noticed that we don't uh, have time in for, a, for this portion of uh, range. Uh, so I added the issue for etcd to add the metric here. I think it's, it, it was missed. Uh, I think it will be quite good to have uh, ability to see how long just this portion takes, you know, not uh, without the raft. Okay, so let's issue some, uh, let's run benchmark for range. And I'm still running my put benchmark, uh, so I'm not gonna stop that. I'm gonna just do the range at the same time. And uh, we've prepared the ranges dashboard that follows a similar structure as our puts and uh, all our dashboards try to follow this structure of we have gRPC, CD server, MVCC on the back end if it's that involved. So not that many metrics for range, unfortunately. Uh, so we have the range started, uh, uh, handled uh, with, uh, with codes, then the latency. Um, so I think we're doing okay-ish. By the way, we actually coring, the, here we're just coring for the empty key. Uh, so, and we're doing this while we're doing a bunch of puts. Uh, so that's why there is some uh, latency uh, that is uh, happening. There's send bytes. Then on the etcd server, we have those slow, slow read index. Again, everything is uh, working fine right now, so uh, it's zero at this point, and we also have uh, uh, failed uh, read index. And the, on, on the MVCC part, we have our range is total. Okay, so that's the, uh, that's the range dashboard. So let's jump into something a little bit more interesting. So in the next two scenarios, we're gonna try to introduce some, uh, we'll try to, try to trigger some failures and delays um, so let's, uh, let's, let's start doing that. So the first scenario, we're gonna try to delay that F-Sync uh, that, uh, uh, that we using to write to a wall, and we'll see how that affects the performance of etcd puts. Uh, so I think we're still running this benchmark. Okay, that's fine. Uh, okay, so to, uh, to add this delay, we're gonna use the go fail library that etcd is built with. And I specifically built this image with go fail enabled to allow for, uh, to allow insert, to allow to insert this uh, delays. You know, the production etcd image uh, has this obviously disabled since it'll probably be like a security uh, uh, red flag. Um, but for our demo, I built with enable, and we're gonna, what we're gonna do here, we're gonna insert sleep in a certain uh, predefined place in code. So in this, this will be in wall before f-sync. So right before we f-sync, there is the, there is, there is the place uh, that will be processed by uh, go fail library, and uh, we have an ability to insert the sleep uh, while our cluster is running. So I'm gonna do that. Okay, and uh, let's check out our puts right away. I'm a little bit worried that we might run out of the space soon. I think we're still good. So after two gigabytes, things start failing, but I think we're not reaching that yet. So, so let's see what, uh, what's happening. So let's wait for a little bit for data to refresh. Okay, here we go. So, so we inserted the uh, 100 milliseconds delay for the F-sync, and right away we see the uh, spikes uh, as expected. Um, now let's see what's happening to our put requests. So we'll also see some slow applies. And then our, so our proposal applied dropping because we can't keep up uh, at the prior rate because of the F-sync. Uh, again, we can't keep up with uh, prior rate. And uh, let's look at the latency. So here we go. The so put latency climbing up slowly. Let's give it a little bit. And the rate of handled uh, puts is dropping.
I'm just waiting for the latency to uh, climb up even more. So this showcases the importance of, of your F-Sync and how it affects the, the put request latency. Uh, so um, important for your production dashboards to um, alerts to, um, to look at the F-Sync. Um, okay, so we added a small delay. Um, so we, we saw the impact. Now let's add like a uh, larger delay, uh, which is one second. And see what's happening. Oops. Okay, going back to our push dashboard. So the latency climbed up uh, per previous. Uh, the data is still not uh, refreshed fully yet. Uh, by the way, notice that the. Um, uh, leader usually processes the request faster uh, than the than other members than the followers. Uh, that's because there is a it saves uh, round trip time uh, uh, because you hit the leader. But uh, it's not recommended to direct uh, your request uh, um, from your client to the leader. Etcd has on the client it has a built-in load balancer, so you always want to really send your uh, specify all the endpoints. Uh, for a city cluster, so it will load balance them. So again, we are now climbing up to uh, like 500 milliseconds. That's because we're doing the one second delay on the F sync. But we still can keep up with the uh, with the traffic. Um, so nothing. We're still getting okay. Of course, our rate uh, dropped. Uh, I mean, in my opinion, this is already kind of reaching the level of unacceptable latency. Um, you see our proposal spending are kind of uh, starting to queue up a little bit more here. And then let's look at the F-Sync. Yeah, so the F-Sync as expected is uh, uh, going to one second. Um, so the conclusion is that we can keep up with our traffic, but uh, if you have uh, uh, some SLOs in terms of the latency, probably uh, those will, will, will start firing. Um, okay, and also let's try running some ranges again and see what happens there. So while our puts are still running. So start the ranges benchmark. You can see that this is like we barely move in. Um, let me open the Rangers dashboard right here. Uh, let's see what we got in terms of latency. So let's wait for a little bit for the. So we are having uh, like four seconds. This, by the way, empty key. There's, so there's no data. Uh, uh, you know, so this is unacceptable. Um, and why? Well, that's because we see the slow uh, read index. So, because uh, Raft is sort of queued up with the uh, processing those ranges because the F-sync is slow, that also affects the read index. And uh, uh, so, this demonstrates how the slow F-sync for what you would say, what you think it would be okay, like why would that portion of the system affect this portion, but because everything synchronizes in Raft and uh, we're doing this read index, uh, your uh, ranges also will be affected. Um, now, I can disable linearizable requirement for our ranges, so I can change the consistency to serializable, and what will what this do, let's try that out, so we see here, like here, we we just flying through this uh, benchmark. So why? Because when we do uh, serializable uh, consistency level, we don't need to coordinate with other uh, etcd members. So we're not engaging our uh, slow, our read index. Um, so we can process the requests uh, much faster. 
Okay, so uh, this shows the, how F-Sync affects the performance of the system. Let's go to a next scenario, which is, uh, which is uh, network uh, delays. Uh, that demonstrates that not only F-Sync matters for SCD, but if you can, you can probably guess that because Raft is coordinating between uh, SCD members, we also network uh, communication between those members also plays a role in the performance. Uh, so we're actually going to start another cluster that has a little bit different setup. So for uh, to introduce some network delays, I'm not using the go fail. I'm using uh, this bridge tool that allows me to proxy traffic between uh, uh, etcd members. And uh, it's also shipped with etcd, not very widely used. Uh, but you can specify this Rx delay uh, when you start it up. And I set it to one second. And we're going we're gonna to see what's, what happens when we do that. So let's. Okay, let's wait for that to get started. Yeah, there's some logs about bridging uh, the traffic. So prepared peers dashboard uh, for for this scenario. So this is some important uh, metrics, in my opinion, that uh, represent the communication between etcd peers. So I include rough proposals in here uh, just because it's uh, uh, important uh, overall, and uh, um, it's always a good idea to, <laughs> I guess, look at uh, how how your proposals are committing. Then we have uh, leader changes. So uh, you know, if, if if you see spikes here and leader is changing frequently, something probably not uh, uh, working right. Uh, so maybe the problem might be with the network um, between your peers. So we have the rough is leader. This is just to indicate who is the uh, leader at the moment. And we have the heartbeat failures. I think we talked about the heartbeat. So it's a D uh, and rough does the. Um, heartbeat between the members and the leader, and uh, if a certain threshold of heartbeat failures is reached, it will um, uh, start a new election. And then uh, for peer networking, so we have this RTT. So etcd, kind of surprising, surprisingly, but RCD, etcd has internal um, prober that uh, probes uh, uh, other members uh, of the cluster. Uh, it uh, issues get requests to a special endpoint, and uh, it records uh, their round trip time in this uh, metric. Um, so we've already started our cluster with one second delay. So that's why you know this is going to one second. Like from prior prior data, you know was was uh, very low. Um, and then we have sent bytes and the received bytes, and there's some. Uh, failures. Uh, so really, this is what I wanted to show you, the indication that our uh, RTT, our round trip time is already delayed. So now let's try running some benchmarks and see what's, what's going to happen to our performance. Okay, so... This is, uh, you can see this is actually already uh, failing. There's some, see some too many requests, uh, so on. Yeah, so let's look at the push dashboard and. So I'm gonna scroll up. Let me run that again to just. Gonna 
wait a little bit for the data to refresh. Let me increase the... Yeah, so we haven't... Uh, uh, we can't even keep up with this at this point. Uh, this demo sometimes has kind of tried to, you know, when I was running this uh, and testing, uh, I didn't, uh, um, it didn't fail right away. So it, it was actually more interesting to, to show that. Um, but of course, when you present, it has to not work as you expect. Uh, but I think it still indicates that, you know, we can't really do the, uh, the puts uh, while our, um, while we have network um, delays between the peers. Okay, so the the purpose of the demo is to uh, show you that not only F sync but also network is important for SED performance. So I'm going to stop this cluster with the network delays. How, by the way, are, how people are doing? If anybody is following along, any questions? Okay. Oh, you have a question? Yeah. Right, so uh, one thing to check is the network. Another thing is like sometimes other operations, like for example, if you uh, run defrag, it will uh, uh, can block the, the backend. Uh, so for compaction can, I think, uh, sometimes cause uh, uh, slowness. Uh, so I would check the, uh, the network. Um, that will be my first. Uh, so check those RTT um, times. Uh, that will be my, my first response. Um, but yeah, there, there may, may be some, something else as well. Um, again, depends on the what version of SD you're running. I think there can be differences between the 3.5 and the 3.4 in terms of the performance. Um, you, you can also maybe be doing like uh, ranges, for example, that uh, uh, slowing down some of the um, some of the puts. So. So apply time uh, includes the uh, the applying portion of the flow. So that's already after the uh, after we committed the message to wall. Uh, but it, I guess, it can block on. Uh, so it's kind of more towards geared towards the B bolt performance. Uh, so I would. I would check what's your database size, for example, uh, uh, and huh? right. So uh, I think you already uh, you already moved beyond the recommended etcd limit for yeah. So uh, so yeah, the apply time is about uh, backend and VCC. So that's kind of past the raft. Uh, or the slow applies. Uh, so I think, like, for example, I've seen, um, like, for example, in Kubernetes, right, if people are coring all pods and in a big cluster uh, and uh, not paging, um, then you might, you know, get into this uh, issue. Hi, 
Yeah. Uh, thanks a lot. That was very insightful. Uh, at some point, you mentioned that uh, as best practice, it was interesting to have like the clients uh, pointing to any member which was not a leader. Is there any uh, like built-in way in the libraries to do so, or like? A so, sorry, can you repeat that again? At some point, I, I believe I understood that you mentioned that it would be as a general practice interesting to have all the clients pointing to uh, non-leader uh, members. Yeah. How do you, uh, in practice? Uh, implement this? So in, in practice, I think if you, uh, in Kubernetes, for example, uh, you specify the etcd endpoints, and usually you list all of them. So you just uh, plug that in, in your connection string, uh, and then uh, SD client will round robin uh, between those endpoints. So let's say it's, uh, you, you kind of control that, right? So if you, uh, specify, okay, this endpoint is a leader, and you just put that, then all the traffic is gonna go there. Then at some point, for example, the leader changes, so that endpoint uh, is a leader no more, so then your logic is flawed, right? So it's not recommended to, uh, to do that, so just specify all the endpoints, and okay. uh, yeah. I just think I misunderstood too, that. I uh, initially thought that uh, you mentioned it was uh, not recommended to send traffic to the leader, but uh, yeah, okay. Well, yeah, I was, I, it's, I right, right. Yeah, what I'm saying is that don't like. Uh, he, here's my leader. I'm just gonna send there, and you know, just because I'm think I think there's gonna be some you know better performance. Uh, so that's what I'm trying to say. Yeah, it makes sense. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thanks for the clarification. Yeah, yeah. I, it's uh, uh, whatever Go exposes. Yeah, so basically it's. Uh, uh, um, F is it called like F data sync or something on, in the huh? yeah but uh, on the Linux API I don't remember what it's called is it li just F sync yeah so uh, the I think there have been some discussions about removing F sync but I think the RAF doesn't really uh, um, um, then, then you might violate um, some of the correctness of RAF uh, and another thing about uh, about this is to watch uh, other uh, services using your disk. And so, for example, uh, if if you run a CD on the node and then you're also making some backups of your you know data directory on the same disk, it might introduce some uh, F-sync delays during when you run that backup. Okay, so let's. Uh, Let's move to the scenario number three. Um, and we're gonna trigger that database size limit. Um, I'm gonna start the cluster again. Oops. So okay, that's our post dashboard. I'm gonna run the puts benchmark with uh, increased value size to trigger this condition. So specified value size there of uh, 10 kilobytes. Let's see what's gonna happen. I'm gonna switch to puts dashboard and I'm gonna look at the database size Okay, so we're kind of climbing up. So we've done uh, about 500 megabytes so far. Let's wait just a little bit for it to reach um, two gigabytes and then uh, observe what's gonna happen. Um, okay, I think we're almost there. Okay, so we reached our limit, and uh, what happens? Etcd then stop will stop uh, accepting new uh, requests, no input requests, and start issuing resource exhausted error code. So that's what I'm gonna try to show you. So yeah, and the handle puts where we also have the error codes, we start seeing the resource exhausted. Um, 
so it's a simple uh, demo, and, but I feel like people get confused about this sometimes. Uh, another point of confusion is when etcd reaches the limit, it sets a so-called alarm. And then to, uh, to get rid of it, you have to go and uh, issue a disarm command, uh, which I've seen people get confused by that. But from the metrics perspective, this is kind of what, what I think to watch out for. So y you need to remember what's your database size limit and have some alerts about, uh, about that. And also, uh, that's one of the reasons to get the resource exhausted code. So uh, that's a, just a simple, and then here you know, we see all these errors for resource exhausted, blah, blah, database space exceeded. So yeah, simple. Um, but important. Okay, now to deal with the space, uh, uh, what are our options? So really the option is compaction. So since etcd maintains kind of all, all the history of your uh, keys, uh, at some point you, you wanna compact the old history. Uh, I linked some docs about the compaction. You can run it in uh, two ways. So there's the compaction call from the client where the client itself d decides when, to, when it wants to compact and issues the compact call. That's what uh, Kubernetes does. It issues the uh, compact uh, every five minutes. But there's also an option to run uh, so-called auto compaction based on time. So I think it's uh, by hours, so you can specify the current compaction every hour. Uh, and there's some logic, I think, some settings to decide what to compact. We're gonna do the call from the client. And uh, I also have a sequence diagram. Uh, I hope these diagrams are, you, you guys can see them. And they're not too confusing with the internals. But uh, compression is actually, implementation in my opinion is quite uh, um, complicated. Uh, but let's try to, to, to go through that. So first of all, an interesting part is that compaction is actually gonna translate into another proposal to, uh, to wall. So if you issue compact to one SCD node, um, it will get uh, replicated and then every node is gonna compact. Um, so similar to other proposals, you get the same metrics, uh, start total, proposal spending, and so on. And then you even save this uh, to a wall, the information about this uh, operation. Uh, but the difference comes when you go to the um, apply, apply portion of this. So that will call this compact method on the uh, MVCC uh, subsystem. And that will uh, in turn schedule compaction. Uh, so there's the notion of the compaction job and uh, um, this gets scheduled and by default uh, SCD server will return to the client but the compaction is still running here. You can specify a flag to, to make it wait uh, but it can be also confusing that it returns right away but you know you just kicked off a compaction that can take you know um, longer. Uh, then you have a scheduled compaction so it compacts the, that in-memory index of revisions first, and then we have this index compaction pause duration metric. Um, it's actually defined on the etcd debugging level, uh, which is indication that it might change, uh, but uh, uh, let's work with that for now. So what that means is just uh, when we issue compact to the index, it will uh, block the index and uh, this just records how long that portion of compaction takes. And then for, to compact actually data on the back end, uh, there's logic to go and determine sort of which revisions to compact, and then it sort of uses this compaction batch limit to, uh, to loop, like it will kind of run multiple loops of compaction batch limit size to, uh, to do this deletes on the back end, and then it records compaction pause, DB compaction pause, but this pause is actually for each cycle of the loop. It's kind of, uh, uh, in my opinion, complicated. Um, there's probably 
good chance to like refactor this, in, but that's what it is right now. And then we have the compaction total, so that includes the whole uh, runtime of the job. Uh, yeah, so um, let's let's try this out and see it on the dashboard. So I'm gonna. I'm issuing the force uh, recreate and minus v to clean up the um, the volumes that um, etcd is mounted uh, with. So that two gigabyte uh, size limit when I stop the cluster and um, it will um, that volume will get blown away. In the interesting portion that the Grafana uh, setup. Uh, uses, uh, I think it's called like external volumes, so that uh, will be persisted. Um, so that's why in the dashboard you kind of see the history of the prior runs. Uh, just, just a side note. Okay, so let's start the cluster. Okay, and uh, now we're gonna run the put benchmark but with compaction. So basically what it's doing is running the running puts, but also it has these options to uh, compact every, there's a compact interval with specified 10 seconds. So in production, you're not gonna be compacting every 10 seconds, but for, for the demo purposes, just to show how the metrics reflect that, we use 10 seconds, and then you have this compact uh, index delta. This is actually only for benchmark, so um, the, the actual command, uh, to etcd still is different. So let's run this. So have a dashboard for you. Again, similar. So again, compaction is the gRPC call again, so we have the gRPC metrics uh, for it. So I guess let's wait for like 10 seconds. For Now on the MVCC part, we have uh, this two metrics, current and compacted revision. So uh, the current one is, uh, as it says, is just the latest revision of, uh, uh, of, of, of the latest uh, change in the database. And then the compacted is the one that, the stuff we compacted below that revision. So the logic of compaction also, no, there's one uh, exception to that rule. If the key then wasn't changed, uh, and its revision sort of is still below, it will keep the latest value of that key. So, you know, so it doesn't remove, uh, doesn't remove the revision of the key, even if it's below uh, compacted revision, if you're trying to, uh, uh, if it's the latest version, right? Because you, you don't want to actually go and say, oh, you know, like, remove the, even the latest version of this key, right? You, you can't really care about the history, so you're trying to clean up the history and there's some, I think it's, you know, that, that's just how it's implemented, but uh, something to keep in mind. Um, so here we can see that uh, because we compile it every 10 seconds, uh, our compacted revision sort of follows um, uh, in step with the current. And then we have uh, the compaction latency. But again, this latency is sort of, uh, not true latency, because this is just the gRPC, and as, as I said, there's a flag, that by default, this will return right away, not waiting for the job to finish. So what you actually care about is uh, this, which is, you can see here, it's like five seconds, is kind of a uh, high. Um, that's because it's looping um, and uh, uh, compacting the, backend in those compact uh, batches. Um, so the good part at least is that it's not blocking the you know, backend for five seconds. So then we have the DB compaction pause. So that's the pause within each iteration of the loop. Um, so that's kind of you know, more reasonable. And then we have the index compaction pause. Um, and then the, the DB size. So now we should, um, 
So the interesting part is that we are writing something, right? But you can see that our DB size is not increasing. Uh, I'm looking at this like, uh, latest portion of the data. This was from the uh, prior run. Uh, why? Because we can uh, compact uh, fast enough to free up the space, and uh, that space will be reused. So this is what the uh, DB total is the total database size, and the size and use is actually what's, uh, uh, what is used by information that, you know, that is valuable. So when you compact stuff, when, when uh, revision and keys are deleted, uh, those uh, bball pages will be moved in so-called uh, free list, and then the next operation can take that, uh, 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 can reuse that space. Okay, so that's the compaction. Okay, there's this optional scenario that might or might not work. Let me try it out, see if I can. Stop the this for now. So uh, what I'm doing here, I'm writing keys with the uh, larger value size, like uh, 10 kilobytes. But I'm also trying to set up a compaction so it kind of keeps up. So you remember when we in, when we did this for each and DB size limit, we reached the DB size pretty quickly. What I'm trying to do here is to uh, not you know not reach the DB size but compact. Uh, so let's 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 run this scenario. Let's, so I'm on the compaction dashboard. So, uh, and we have a 30 seconds interval set in that test. So, um, we need to wait a little bit longer. Let's jump to the revisions. I think that, that's probably the best way to see the compaction updates things. Okay, so, so it compacted, this jumped up towards the current. So let's, let's give it a, a moment. Um, let's now look at our, let's look at actually how long that compaction took. Yeah, so DB compaction pauses increasing. Um, The index pauses um, also up. Let's see how we're doing with the space. So with the space, so we're kind of okay-ish. So we're not reaching that two gigabytes. That's what we're trying to do with the scenarios, try to uh, make it run for longer and to be able to compact and keep up. And at some point, we should start seeing errors. So now we're, we're still doing puts with this benchmark. So let's look at our put performance. Make sure that this is still good. Okay, so still running. Oops. So we're still doing okay here, but let's give it just a couple more minutes. Time we have 15 minutes. Okay, I was still keeping up. Yeah, I said DB compaction pauses raises to like one second because we're compacting all those uh, large uh, key values. And then the full compaction takes like a really long time. And so I'm hoping that, 
this is going to cause issues with our puts finally. Well, we still can keep up. Um, again, as I, as I said, this scenario is optional. Uh, it's kind of hard to trigger that error uh, reliably. Uh, this was. Okay, let's move on. As I said, this is optional. Um, let's now jump into uh, defragmentation. So when we uh, compact in uh, our backend, we have that difference between the uh, total space that database takes and the uh, space in use. Uh, so sometimes you want to reduce your total space, and uh, for that, uh, you, you want to run defragmentation. I'm going like, to link you to the docs. Um, and so let's try it out on the cluster. OK, I think we started getting some errors there. But anyway, I'm going to move on. I don't have much time. OK, so. Gonna write some data with the quick put benchmark. And then I'm gonna run this uh, puts with compaction. Okay, let's check out our. Puts dashboard. Let's look at the DB size right away. Where is it? Right here. Okay. So let's wait, wait a little bit. Okay, so our uh, DB size is, um, because we did that initial puts, we got some data in. So now, and we're doing just uh, uh, smaller puts, but with compaction. And we can see that our uh, DB size in use, for example, is a little bit less than the total DB size. Uh, so this is where the compaction will be helpful when we, well, well, defragmentation will be helpful when we do defrag then the total DB size will, will get reduced to what is actually in use. Um, and uh, let's run the defrag. Okay, and then I also have a dashboard for defrag. So we can see, so we ran the defrag on the um, etcd3 here. By the way, defrag uh, is not like compaction in the sense that it's only done per member. So there is no uh, writing that to the logs and then replicating everywhere. And ex I'll explain why. So we can see that our uh, total DB size uh, got uh, uh, like dropped here 
to the DB size and use. So that was the result of defragmenting this member. Um, so what defragmentation does, it will uh, read all the keys and reinsert back uh, to, the, to the new backend. Uh, it's a pretty heavy operation, and while it's doing that, it's gonna block uh, uh, all the backend uh, writes. So, if your defrag uh, will take takes long time, uh, then you're gonna experience some failures uh, in terms of the requests, incoming requests, and this is what the next scenario is about. But we only have ten minutes, so I wanna make sure I have some, I leave some time for questions. Um, anybody has any questions? Yeah. Yeah, so it, it, it literally goes to sync and just blocks, yeah, like takes a lock on the whole backend. And uh, it blocks writes on that member, right? So it's like the applied portion of the uh, flow, right? So the write it still will be written to the wall log, so it will be committed. So the raft itself still works. The f-sync to wall still works, but the backend is blocked. So then what happens is if, if your defrag, for example, runs for some number of time, you get a difference between committed and applied. Um, I have that metric there. And then after some threshold, it's just like, okay, no more, uh, and uh, starts responding. I think, I believe it was like too many requests, yeah. Um, so yeah, so to answer your question, it does block the whole thing. So when a, a node is running to defrag, is there a problem for clients to still send requests to that node? Yeah, yeah, so actually this, there was a change recently, like uh, ideally, right, would, what you would want is when we have a defrag, that node should be not serving traffic. And uh, SD client has internal load balancer, but it doesn't know about the fact that that node is running the defrag. So it still sends uh, uh, you know, traffic until, let's say, it, uh, the, the, if, if the request starts failing, then yeah, the load balancer will you know, uh, distribute load to, uh, to other members. But there are other situations, and then there's a change recently that uses now um, a gRPC health um, implementation to actually notify client uh, from the member to take out the uh, member from the uh, from serving traffic for the period of defrag. That's much like two weeks ago, so it's not probably in the. Uh... Yeah, so it, it you can end up uh, failing if your defrag takes a long time. Um, and th I think that's the last scenario that I had there was the add-in delay uh, that tries to mimic that problem. Because what I did there, I just added a delay to a uh, defrag using the go fail and then um, while running puts, um, that should trigger some errors to demonstrate that. Um, any other questions? Can you use the mic? Yeah. Does the compaction cause any performance issues? <laughs> well, I guess it's a loaded question. It all depends on like, uh, you know, uh, how much you compact in and uh, uh, so on. So you, you do want to watch for those metrics. So one of the scenarios is an optional one, right? I was trying to trigger an issue by running a compaction and uh, uh, when the compaction was taken, uh, you know, a long time and the pauses were kind of climbing up. So, uh, yeah, it, it, let's say it can cause an issue, but usually it won't, it won't. In the normal operations, like if you're compacting every five minutes, uh, you should be um, good. But the point of the demo, I think you should be watching those metrics just to uh, be aware of what's going on in the system. Uh, so that's, that's, uh, in Kubernetes, I, I think the, that five minutes compaction, I think works, uh, pretty well in my experience. Um, yeah. I mean, I've seen people not compacting, but you know, don't, don't like for not Kubernetes, uh, uh, use cases, but. Yeah. Thank you.
sorry, I take that back. Not defragging. Uh, you, you always want to compact because you're going to run out of the out of the space uh, pretty quickly. Uh, yeah. Um, you really have to, I'm not like expert on the Kubernetes uh, storage layer, uh, but uh, um, so I don't have a good answer for you. Uh, I know that, uh, well, I don't have an answer on top of my head. I know there's like a storage layer in Kubernetes that uh, abstracts away etcd, and uh, you know, it, it has its interface, um, and uh, that's, uh, that's how it operates. Uh, it uses notion of revisions, so, uh, the revisions that etcd exposes, uh, I think they're important for Kubernetes to keep in track of uh, sense. For example, for compaction, I know that uh, Kubernetes keep track of the last compacted revision or something like that, and uh, then makes the calculations based on that. Any other questions? Again, we didn't, uh, I, I, hope, I hope this was useful. I think the purpose was to really uh, show like some failure scenarios, and again, I know this is not production. It's it's uh, everybody has their own hardware and uh, SLOs and so on and the sizes. Uh, but maybe this kind of gives a starting point, uh, like describes areas you can look look uh, at, and maybe put some uh, some of these metrics on your dashboards. Um, uh, another area is watches that we didn't really touch at all, and Kubernetes uses uh, uh, uses that, um, and we didn't touch leases. Um, but yeah, I hope uh, this was useful. If if something doesn't work, uh, yeah, file an issue against the um, depository, um, and if also and an, now there will be another talk tomorrow from one of the SCD maintainers who will. Uh, uh, diving into um, um, some interesting challenges operating etcd. So I recommend going checking checking that out. Um, let's see what else. So in terms of the metrics, uh, you know, if if you find some metrics are not useful or can be improved or added, it will be you just file an issue against etcd, uh, or you're welcome to contribute as well. I think it's relatively easy to add a metric to etcd. Um, yeah. Oh yeah. Sorry. So they are in the GitHub. They are you. They are you done using the the Mermaid tool. So it's just a link. So I think they should be there. If you just click the link, it should open the Mermaid. Oh, yeah, which flow charts? My or from the in beginning of the. Yeah, so those should be in the in there. In it's part of the README. It's just a link to a Mermaid. Look for sequence diagrams. I think that's how I. And for the flow charts, I did try to simplify certain components like collapse, for instance. So if you actually go and go to and explore the code base, uh, which I really recommend doing, uh, you know. It might be even more complicated than on the flowchart, uh, but I just couldn't uh, uh, reasonably fit it into into the chart. I saw that's 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 already there in the README. But if you open it, it should give you the, um, hold on. Okay. Oh, okay, yeah, I got it. I saw that. Uh, Right, right here on this side. Do you, does so. Oh, okay. Yeah, sounds good. Yeah, for sure. Typo? Yeah, <laughs> probably. <laughs> 
Um, okay, thank you, folks. And we're there's out also, of time. Um, just at the last slide, there's feedback. Just in case we want to give, there's a QR code with the link. Um, just in case we have any feedback, please feel free to do that. Thank you.